have um, a new sixth one that we are adding because of some of the shenanigans that may have occurred in the last couple of days. Um, so it's kind of like five and a half, how about that? Uh, so before we really get started, um, make sure that y'all are, oh good, somebody hit record. Uh, make sure that y'all are aware that we're recording uh, because this will go onto our YouTube channel. Um, and you can find that on YouTube as MTSU online. And that is where all of our previous videos are. So if there's ever anything that you want to go check out that we've done before, um, please go there and check it out. There are also a ton of presentations coming up um, with the LT and ITC. Some are co-sponsored with MTSU online. Some are from other departments around campus, but make sure y'all go check out that workshop schedule and get signed up for uh, as many that are coming up that interest you. I know MTSU online, uh, we are co-sponsoring one next week on video note just to kind of go over a little bit how video note works in your class and how that helps with engagement and then we have one coming up on september 20th um, that is where we will give you a, a crash course in how to use h5p which is a brand new technology for us to use at mtsu that's fully integrated into d2l um, so it's not a new technology, but it's newly free to all faculty on campus and it fully integrates in your D2L. So if you are looking for some fun engagement ways to get your students going in your class um, with some active learning and really awesome stuff, that is one you're going to want to come to because we're going to teach you how to do some of that stuff. Um, so those are a couple that we have coming up. Um, and if you miss those, they're on the calendar or they're in our new newsletter that we just produced our inaugural newsletter. Um, MTSU Online has clearly been busy in the last few minutes. Um, so um, joining me today in this presentation, um, in case I didn't introduce myself, I think everyone knows me, but I'm Dr. Kim Godwin and I'm one of the instructional designers for MTSU Online. And joining me today, helping with chat and um, answering questions are Tara Perrin and Karen Hine, the other two instructional designers for MTSU Online. So. Um, we will go ahead and get started with uh, me screen sharing and showing you some things in um, my one of my D2L development shells. You are welcome to minimize us if you want to go into your D2L shell at the same time and just listen to us talk um, and kind of play around with some of the things we're showing you so that you can see it and practice while we're going through the things. Uh, so if nobody else needs anything, we're going to hit the screen share and then you're going to see me looking this way a lot because my camera is over here, but my better screen is over here. So just know you get a great profile for the rest of this time. I uh, hope y'all are all right with that. There we go. Okay, can, can everyone see this screen? I'm going to make it bigger, but can y'all see the screen okay? Okay, so the first things that we're gonna talk about in our um, five and a half for fall updates um, is the text box editor. Um, and I am just gonna show you a quick update of what happened with that um, over the summer. It's in your D2L announcements um, that are on that main page, but I wanted to just give you a quick look of what that actually looks like now and show you some of the bigger changes that happen and how those might impact you. Um, so anywhere that you have a text box, whether that be uh, on any page that says add a description, if it's your, you're creating a new news item, if it's, um, if you're creating uh, any kind of questions or anything, your question library for quizzes, um, discussions, anything that you're creating, um, the directions box, the drop box, anything. Um, this is the text box that pops up, the one that's on the screen right now. Um, and really what's happened is that things are in a slightly different order. Um, so it's, there's nothing has disappeared. Some things may look a little bit different and they're in a different order. Um, this formatting stuff used to be over here on the right. 
uh, and this information used to be on the left. Um, so that's really the big difference. It's still there. It just looks a little bit different. Um, and then some of the resources that used to be at the bottom of your text box are now actually up in the top of the text box where all the other information is. So everything's really more centrally located in one place. So the biggest thing of note is that the insert stuff button that is referred to a lot in um, some of our old videos and some of um, other information that y'all may have had. The insert stuff button used to look like the little YouTube play button, the little, you know, the little YouTube button. It used to look like that. And it now is um, an insert stuff button that looks like play, pause, record, and stop kind of stacked on top of each other. And it's now much further to the right, uh, but it still does all the same things. So when you click on it and a box pops up, it still has all of the same features that it had previously. Um, it's just changed locations, that's all. Um, the accessibility checker for your text box used to be one of the ones that was down in the bottom right. It is now into this main text uh, options bar. So it's now up here. Um, so I do encourage you sometime to kind of go and take a look and see what's happening with some of those things. Um, one of the other things a couple of people have asked me about, um, there used to be a spell check at the bottom of your text boxes. And I think a few people have been a little bit nervous about that not showing up anymore. Um, but I can show you that um, it now actually just does it automatically and has the little red squiggle. So if you uh, don't, if you don't spell "Hi, I'm Kim" correctly, it will automatically tell you that uh, you you don't know how to spell your own name. So you don't have to worry as much about finding the spell check because it's much more auto, like when you're typing things into any other kind of document that you're working on. Um, that being said, please remember, as with all things that you spell check, if you misspelled a word into another word it doesn't have any way of telling you that it's wrong um so just remember that um so a couple of other little things about text boxes before we move on to the next thing people often ask about this too these three little lines down here in the bottom right corner if you click on that and drag it extends your box and makes it a different size um so if you're having a hard time putting things in and you don't like the way it's scrolling just make your box bigger and that will be a little bit easier for you. There is also the full screen option, which are these four arrows in the top right. Makes it a full screen, type anywhere you want, you want on it, but in order to save it, if you go to full screen, you have to convert it back to the small screen. Um, it can't be full screen and, and update or save. So that's just a, a couple of little update tips about that. Uh, any questions about text box editor changes before we move to the next topic. And if you have questions, please make sure to stick those in the chat because Tara and Karen are awesome at uh, chat question answering. Well, they're awesome at a lot of things, but they're definitely awesome at that. So, uh, okay. So moving on to the next thing on our list is rubrics. Uh, I don't know how many of you use rubrics. We talk about how awesome and easy they are for grading, especially if you're grading a lot of, of students and a lot of things because they are um, hot button. You just click on it and it will auto grade and give you some information. There's been a small change in how rubrics are graded for drop boxes. Uh, discussions are still the, the little hot button ones um, for now. And I can show you those if you want to, just so you can see what I'm talking about. Uh, but the drop box has changed a little bit and it's now a sliding scale. So I'm gonna go to grades. This is actually, as like a side note, this is actually how I do all of my grading um, is that I go to grades because it, it makes more sense to me and it's easier for me because I see the little orange dot that lets me know that the student has submitted something. And when you click on, the information that they submitted, everything that this student submitted shows up in one spot with that rubric right up at the top. Um, and the rubric, you can just click on the hot buttons and it tells you whether or not somebody did a good job. 
and it adds it up for you and all of the students information is down in here. Um, so just thought I would show you all that that's the, that's the different. The computer is smarter than me. Um, so in assignments, I wanted to show y'all what the new rubric looks like in assignments. So when you open up assignments now, um, it gives you the, the rubric as a sliding scale instead of as the boxes that you push. So I had attached my infographic assignment rubric. Um, I guess I should let y'all see my, my awesome. Here's my infographic, uh, assuming that the internet doesn't go down again this morning. There you go, there's my infographic. Um, I'm probably not gonna get a very good score on my infographic, but it's fun. So, um, so the way that the new slider rule ones work is that you actually just mouse over them. Um, instead of it being the big box up to the top, it's over to the side and the information pops up underneath the little slider rule. Um, instead of all of the information being in a big box, it's a little box with the information underneath it. It's a small change, but it's enough of a change that we wanted to make sure that you all knew about it. If you use rubrics, changes like that can make you go, what just happened in my detail broke? It didn't break. It's just, it takes up less space for you and it's a little bit easier to navigate uh, so that you are actually looking at what the student submitted at the same time that you're grading it. So it can make it a little bit easier, um, especially if you're using some of the um, annotations and things right in your D2L grader, you can make those comments and then come over and adjust your, um, your rubric right there. So um, I'm gonna just give Mo a really fantastic score um, on this rubric. So, um, Mo got a 50. Um, it says it was only a 10 because I didn't adjust that to reflect my rubric. So just know you should do that. Um, this is where you would put your feedback. And then we will publish that. And now we are done with that one. Um, so it now shows that Mo got 100 on that assignment. It was linked to the rubric. By the way, if y'all ever need any sample copies of rubrics, we have a ton. Um, so let us know and we're happy to send them to you. And then you can, um, and we'll actually send them to you as a D2L export um, so that you can just load them right into your D2L. And then you can make any changes that you want in D2L. You don't have to create them as a, a Word file. You can use the ones that we have and update them as you go. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the new look of rubrics before we hop on to the next one? Okay, checklists. Um, this is one uh, people frequently have questions about checklists, especially near the beginning of the semester. Um, checklists are great for helping students know the order in which that they need to take care of the content for the semester. Uh, they also work really, really great if you have a big project that has a lot of steps and you wanna help students go through multiple steps. Uh, they're really, really great for that. So a checklist, we have some that are created in here and uh, Tara or someone will be putting our uh, creating a checklist cheat sheet into the chat so that you can download that and have it. Uh, but checklists, this is what they look like. These are not fancy and done. Um, but this is what they look like. It simply is just a step by step what it is that students need to do. You can link directly to content within your class. You can link directly to activities. You can embed a YouTube video or um, a Panopto video or a video note or any of those things directly into each of these boxes because they are those same text boxes that we talked about in descriptions and at the beginning. So you can put anything you want in these. I do encourage with checklists that you don't put more than one or two things within each task. If you put 15 things in a task, that task needs its own checklist because most people can't do 15 things at one time. So if you want to specifically list out individual things that you want people to complete, then you need to do that as a separate checklist 
as more than one task within the checklist, uh, but not one really big checklist. So the way that I sometimes do that is you can see from the, the task one that mine says require or review resources. Instead of listing all of the resources, you can actually go into where it says review resources and then I can link it. I can link it straight to my content. So you click on content, you go straight to module one. Oh, and then I click on required resources. And then there's a plus button in the top right and that links to the whole sub module or module. So it doesn't link to an individual item, it links to the whole folder, which is pretty cool if you've got a bunch of stuff that you want them to go look at a bunch of things instead of listing out each thing individually you can do it like that and then when the student clicks on it it takes them to that actual sub module and it lists all the things that they need to do there um, so that's just one way to kind of think about how to do those but i wanted to show you quickly how to create a checklist in case this is something that you think will help you uh, we're only a couple of days into the semester, so you could definitely create one now um, to help your students get going. You could create them for later in the semester for bigger projects or things that you have. But you click on new, and then you go to new checklist. It pops up. You give it a title. You can look. Y'all know I can't spell. Um, if you're doing it in an active class, keep it hidden where it says hide from users so that you don't cause a panic amongst your students when something new shows up that you're still working on. Um, so make sure you keep it hidden if it's in an active class. Type in your instructions if you want them. Um, typically for me, the instructions are things like, as you complete a task, make sure to check the box so that it tracks your completion. Um, so you put a little bit of information in there, you hit save, it opens up to this, add a new list. You can name your list. I tend to name my list after the module or after the topic. Um, so module one maybe, or um, if my topic happens to be checklist, I would name it checklist. Um, so you can change this to anything you want because it's an active button. And then you simply just start adding tasks. Um, on down as many as you need. And that's how you create a new checklist. Uh, we wanted to show you that it's a little bit different if you do it through edit course. Um, edit course, you can create a checklist through edit course um, the same, same way you would other things. You go to edit course and you click on checklist. It looks different when you create a new checklist um, and how it is in here. Um, and so we wanted you to know that so that if you're following our cheat sheet, our cheat sheet follows it from correcting, from creating it directly into a module, not from edit course, because edit course is the way that it does it is different. Um, so I can show you what I mean by it's different. So Remember when I was when I created it from the class, it was you just click on it and it creates a new task and it creates a new task in here. You actually go in and click new item, new category, and you have to you have to have assigned a category. So that part where I said rename it, whatever you want, list one, you actually have to create a new category and then you have to add your your items from there. Um, so we just wanted to show you that it's a little bit different depending on how you get there. So our cheat sheet gets you there from adding new, but you can also add them from here if you prefer. So that was all I needed to show you with that. And we will probably at some point later in the year do a presentation on checklists because it's one that people ask about a lot. But if you have questions, we do have a video on our YouTube channel about checklists. So feel free to pop in there and take a look at that. Um, or if you have any questions, just give one, us, one of us a call and we're happy to help out. Anybody have any questions about checklists? Because we're sailing right along. I 
I do okay. want to jump in. Sorry, yeah. Dr. Godwin. I do no, want to no. jump in and say when it comes to checklists, um, really consider whether or not you want to add due dates to the checklist rather than the tool itself. That's the one little tricky thing um, that can happen with checklists, because if you use task one, task two, task three as your titles and you use the due date feature, all it's going to tell the calendar is that task one is due if you don't change that name. So typically to save you time and not have to change every name, we recommend putting the due date with the tool directly instead of in the checklist. Yes, yes. And I'm good, I'm out. Thank you, no, that was perfect, thank you. Okay, um, I think next is the how to add my evaluations widget. So um, course evaluations have changed. Um, they're through a new process now. Uh, I don't know if y'all know that, but they have. Um, so in a couple months, when it's time for us to really worry about course evaluations, this needs to already be in your class so that you don't have to think about it. Um, some of you, it may already be in your class um, because it was added to the um, general template that comes with D2L when you get a new active course shell, it's already in there. If you change your homepage or NAF bar at all, from the way that it comes from the FITSE, you're gonna to wanna to add on your own the My Evaluation back into your class. It is easy to do. Um, we're gonna walk you through how to do it so that you, you can get it in there if you used any other layout at all from the one that comes in as the default from the FITSE. Specifically, um, I already put it in there. Um, let's see if I have one that doesn't. Um, Specifically, if you use the MTSU online template, we have updated our template. It is now in our template. But if your master course is older than um, about two weeks ago, then yours isn't in there unless we've had a chance to go in and add it. Um, so you're going to want to double check that and go in and add it. Okay, so to add, let's see if it's in here. Man, I was on the ball with this, wasn't I? I added it everywhere. <laughs> I may just have to show you how to add a widget and one that has it. Um, let's try. Y'all are looking at all of my stuff. Now you can see everything. We're going to just see if it's in this one. It's there. It's in this one too. Okay. So I was too on the ball. So I've already put it in all of my stuff, um, but I'm still going to show you how to do it. So when you scroll to the very bottom of your home page of your course homepage, there's three little dots at the bottom. If you click on those three little dots and you go to edit homepage, your homepage will pop up. All you do is scroll down just a little bit to this middle where it says widgets you select add widgets, a box pops up that lists every single widget that's available at MTSU. Just scroll on down until you find the one that says my evaluations. And then you click add and it pops up in that area where you added the, you can add it to either side. I like it on the right side. It works better for me and my brain, um, but it will pop up right there. Now I have two. So I'm gonna delete the one that was in there previously. Um, so it's now in my widgets and all I need to do is decide where I want it on my right side. So for me, um, it's one that I can always go move later in the semester because moving them is super easy. You go over those eight dots, you click it with your mouse and you drag it. Um, so for me, I'm actually gonna put it below my calendar so that it's in there and I know it's in there and I remember it's in there. But when I get closer to the end of the semester and it's time for students to do those evaluations, I'm actually gonna move it further up um, and maybe move other things around. Um, there's fewer things in the calendar by that point. So your calendar is shorter. Hopefully by the end of the semester, they know your name and the instructor information may not need to be top of the list. I guess that would depend, um, but hopefully they know your name by the end of the semester. So maybe moving it further up um, at the end of the semester puts it right in the student's line of sight 
Um, but because it's easy to move, you can keep moving it around as much as you need to. So I'm going to put mine underneath the calendar. And then you need to hit save and close down in the bottom left hand corner. And when you do that, it saves it to your homepage. Your homepage is now set. You now have the My Evaluation link that is ready to go for when it's time for course evaluations. Does anybody have any questions about how to add that widget? Um, adding a, a special widget or one that you want to create is substantially more involved and we can help you do that. This is one that it's automatically in your D2L. So you simply have to just click that little box and then hit save and it will save it to your, to your desktop. Um, yeah, any questions about my evaluations or adding a widget? Hey, Dr. Godwin, um, sure. Holly's asking about evaluations from summer showing comparison across departments, colleges, universities, that there seems to be less information um, and that you could add extra questions before. And, and she said that's not an option anymore. Do you know anything more about that or do we um, need to direct them? Yeah, we her? need to direct them to okay. institutional effectiveness. Um, I do know that there were, uh, it was kind of like a pilot this summer and there was some information that uh, didn't necessarily all get converted. Um, so that's what I know. I know if I click on mine, um, it doesn't, there's nothing in it and there's no way for me to add questions um, in mine. So those are some of the things I know institutional effectiveness has been looking at. And I think that uh, Sheila might have mentioned that they are going to have a presentation at some point, maybe, to help us know. Um, but we'll keep an eye out for that. And if we hear anything, we'll make sure to let people know too. Can I ask one question? Is any, this size, is Emily? I'll turn mm -hmm. my video on. Um, there you go. Is anyone just not seeing that screen? I get nothing. Like my evaluations are there. It just goes to a blank nothing screen. And I thought that was normal because evaluations hadn't happened, but you have this page. I don't have that. I have a just, it goes to like nothing sphere. <laughs> well, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you might want to reach out to over to institutional effectiveness and see what's going on with that. Um, I know there were some some things that were a little strange this summer, um, depending on people's status um, at like what level of faculty status they were. And by that, I mean full time or adjunct. I don't mean like, are you a are you a lecturer? Are you a full professor? I meant like full full and part time. There were some questions and issues there, um, and I. My understanding too is that some some of the newer faculty it hasn't quite populated yet. So I don't know. I've I've been here for ten years. Yeah, you've been here for a minute. I have no so idea. I don't know. So yeah, you'll probably want to reach out to institutional effectiveness on that. Um, now this is see. useful. I didn't realize I was supposed to be seeing something. So now I know there's a problem. Right. Right. I'm so glad I could help. <laughs> <laughs> Great. What other questions? Excuse me. <laughs> Can I ask one more? Sure. Uh, where I want to look and see if my summer evaluations are there. What should I be clicking on to look at this, my past, this summer's evaluation? Uh, go to your active summer class and click on it there. Click on what? My Do you have the My Evaluation tab in your summer class? No. Okay. You can add it and then click on it. And then we'll know. Okay, thank you. I will. You're welcome. Ah, it won't let me edit my course. And it won't let you edit your homepage? No. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Yes, it will. <laughs> While she's doing that, I can tell you, y'all can also edit your homepage from the edit course. Um, the one thing to know on that is, is we've been talking about widgets. When you go to edit course and do the site setup information and you want to add a widget, you actually do want to do it from the home page button, not the widget button. The widget button is how you create a new widget. It is not how you assign a widget to your home page. So if you want to use this route to add to your home page, you click on home page. You then look up here where it says active homepage and you figure out which one it is you have that's active. Um, mine happens to be the MTSU online homepage template. And then you scroll down and find that one, click on it. Um, if it is not 
blue and hyperlinked, um, or at least not hyperlinked, it means that you can't edit it and you'll need to make a copy by clicking on the arrow and making a copy. If it is blue, you can edit, you click on it, and then it takes you to that same page that we are on from the three dots at the bottom. Um, so the reason I say go to the three dots at the bottom of your homepage is that is one step. It just took us like five to get here. <laughs> so I'm a big fan of the one step first five. So, but you can do it from your edit, your edit course page, if you prefer to do it that way. And just remember anytime that you change any, any homepage information, if you change your homepage, like you decide to make a copy and change your homepage, make sure you come back up here and click which one it is that you changed it to and apply or your change won't take effect. So, um, okay. Any, you know, I, yes. I have reached out and we hope to have a workshop on this soon, <laughs> or at least a question and answer session. Awesome. Uh, something like that, so. Yay, yay. <laughs> We're excited about that too, because uh, we have a lot of questions um, and people ask us a lot of questions. We want to make sure we're giving the right information. So thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, any other my evaluation questions before we move on to tutor me? Just to say, yeah, that didn't work. So I'll oh, deal I'm, with it later. I'm sorry. Uh, institutional effectiveness. They're very nice. I'm sure they have good answers. Um, okay, tutor me. So I don't know if y'all know much about tutor me. Um, those of you that teach D section classes, uh, tutor me is something that is available to MTSU online students. Um, it is technically only available to MTSU online students because it comes out of um, the distance fee. Um, but I'm going to show y'all how to add it. So what it is is a 24/7 tutoring opportunity in I think every subject out there, um, but it's really awesome because it, it allows for live 24 seven tutoring um, through a digital format. So sometimes um, a student needs a tutor at three in the morning. And we may not have a lot of options um, in our face-to-face -face tutoring center on campus at three in the morning. Um, so this is just an op option to help support our students in terms of, of tutoring and getting the support they need. So similar to the same way that you add a widget um, to your homepage is how you add something to your navigation bar if Tutor Me is not already there. So you will click on the three dots that are on the right hand side of your nav bar, edit this nav bar, and then we scroll down just a little bit to where it says add links. And then we find Tutor Me, which is way down at the bottom. Uh, Tutor Me is down here at the very bottom. You click on the box right next to it. You hit Add. It now shows up in the tabs that will appear on your nav bar. Uh, and then similar with my evaluation box and widget, I move mine so that it is in a place that makes more sense. Um, so I think it needs to be pretty early on. So I actually moved mine. So it is actually before help. Um, and then it's right there. You hit save and close at the bottom of the screen. And it automatically shows up in your nav bar. And part of the reason I wanted to show you how to add it is I want to give you just a very quick tour on how it works. Um, and I don't know if we have added it, but we also have like a little statement that you can add to your course about tutor me so if you need a copy of that we can definitely send that to you um, or we may actually be able to get it added to the chat um tutor me for your students to use tutor me it has to be in your nav bar it has to be there that's how it it links that's how it makes the connection and allows your student to be logged in using their um the securities that come with being embedded in d2l so to use Tutor Me, you simply click on it in your nav bar. It takes them out to the secondary site. You then connect with the tutor. And you are now connected with Tutor Me. And the student can connect with a live tutor. Uh, there, there's also a writing lab for getting writing help. 
I, I will say I haven't used this writing lab, but I have used the MTSU University writing lab and they're awesome and have a ton of online services. So make sure you encourage your students to use the university's online writing lab. This is really more for like your the 3 a.m. and it's due at four um, panic. Um, not that anyone would ever do that, right? Um, so I do encourage you to use the university writing lab as much as you can. Um, but connecting with a live tutor, you simply click on the button type in what subject area you are looking for, uh, and then it searches and it provides you with a list of possible tutors that you can connect with. You can also use these subjects drop down in the top left corner. Um, each, each one of these has additional drops from it that take you into all of the different areas that people might. So especially if you don't find it like right off, just looking right off, some of them may be kind of embedded in other places. Um, one of the ones we were looking for the other day was um, social work is actually under professional, education is under professional. So have your students look around a little bit if they don't see it right away, it may be kind of hidden underneath something else. So that is tutor me. Um, and this person really wants to talk to me, but um, I'm good. So we have a chat. That's how you know how live it is though, is that there is a tutor reaching out to me right now. So um, that is Tutor Me. Does anybody have any questions about Tutor Me? I think we've addressed most of the questions about Tutor Me, but we do have questions about making nav bars more custom customizable as far as the drop downs. Can you talk about that at all or show that? Yeah, I wonder if I could ask one specific question I had about that was, um, uh, when you customize, it like sometimes gives you the option to, to change things that are in a group drop down in the customized nav and sometimes it doesn't let you. And I wonder if you could explain that because uh, I was trying to create a drop down and it, and it it was, I was definitely messing with my system. So I backed up and just gave up, but I, I'm just curious uh, if you can speak to that. Sure, um, I can speak to that, but I'm gonna, start, I'll, I'll show you all a little bit about how to do it. Customizing a dropdown is not easy um, because you have to create a new dropdown and then add the things in it and then take one out and add one in. So customizing a dropdown is not super easy, um, but the MTSU online official statement on customization of nav bars is, please don't. Um, and, and here's my caveat to that. Um, it's fine if you need to take things out that you feel like are not of benefit. And this isn't just to you, Michelle, this is like a universal statement. Um, so every student um, that gets into every single class has to search the class um, for information. And the, the first place they go is their nav bar. If every single course has a different nav bar, it gets very confusing for students and it's harder for them to figure out how to be successful in their class. Um, it's just an opportunity for them to know, I know I always go here and there will always be course time and then there'll always be content and then there'll always be assessments. Um, and keeping it kind of streamlined for them is, is why we say, think about it before you really make a lot of changes to your nav bar as to what that's gonna look like for your student. If they are taking my class and they're taking your class and they're taking five other classes and every one of us has a different nav bar, it kind of can create some confusion for students. Um, it's kind of a barrier that we try to avoid. I can't stop you from changing your nav bar. Just know that that is, that is our general stance on it. It also, when you get too many things across the top, like if we pull everything out, um, and you mentioned that you were creating new groups, so you probably wouldn't have this problem. But when we pull everything out and we end up with 12 or 15 things across our nav bar, our nav bar doesn't fit. So students have to continuously click more to see where things are and they don't instinctively know to keep clicking more to look for something. So we can kind of create an issue with that if we pull things out too much individually um, because they have to keep clicking more. And if they are using the Pulse app or they are viewing it on a phone or a tablet, the longer the nav bar, the harder it is for them to use. Um, 
because it it creates some weird flow issues when you're using it in Pulse um, and other places. So yes, you are welcome to change it. Um, you can change it if you need to, um, but we do encourage people to kind of think about how they're changing it um, and why they're changing it so that, and then if you do make sure that you let your students know that you have updated your nav bar to reflect specifically the items that they're using in the class. Um, and that's why yours looks different as you remove the other things or added something, a different resource in there. Um, so I hope that helps a little bit. I felt like I have to give the little. No, I think, that's, I think that's a really good spiel because even when I was thinking of customizing, I was like, okay, I don't want to customize so much that this would be hard. I, it's more about like moving the things that we use to the top of the drop down, but I wonder maybe that's just a future feature of like, even if we could just hide things that we don't use, but not change where they are. Because mm -hmm. um, it just seems like there's so many things in drop downs that my classes don't use. So I thank you for that, though. That's very helpful. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I think the one question I just had, though, when you do make a customization, though, I will be very careful when I do. Um, <laughs> yeah, sort of. I I wasn't really clear on how to create a new group. Um, and more was able to like take things out of, I think either communication or assessments, but I won't, mm -hmm. but I, uh, okay, I think it was one of them is allows you to take things out and one doesn't, right? Um, you can take things out um, through the, um, when you're in the custom, yeah. So it's through creating custom links. Um, and it's when you're in, when you're in them, it's actually easier for you to create a new grouping for yourself than it is to try to take something out of one that's already in there um, because of the way it acts and behaves. But then you need to make sure whatever you name it makes sense to you because you may have two assessment. Um, so you make sure you delete the right one. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is usually where I run into an issue with that, but you can um, create them by creating a custom link and then you can go in and um, add or remove the different, so that's, that's how you do that is you just create a custom link and then it allows you to add different information in there from that. Um, you may also want to look around at custom links that already exist and see if there's one that's similar uh, that you want to add um, and other custom groups that are available and see if one of those is one that you can get in and edit and make changes to. Uh, it's not the easiest of processes to change the grouping though. I don't know that I necessarily answered your question, but it's not super easy. No, you, so you got as far as when I started having problems. I, I'll take this offline because I don't want to derail the whole conversation. Okay. I really appreciate this though, because at least you validated that it's hard. Yeah, yeah it's not easy. It's hard. Um, cool. it, it's one of the things that I, I feel like D2L made it intentionally hard. Yeah, so it may be intentionally hard, and I get that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Absolutely. One other question, Dr. Godwin, specific sure. to you is how come you don't have Zoom and videos in your nav bar? Because I have removed those from my nav bar. Um, because, um, and some of this goes back to um, if you're using the MTSU online template, um, they are not in our MTSU online template initially because when the MTSU online template was created, we didn't have universal Zoom. We didn't have institutional Panopto. Um, we also didn't have universal Examity. Um, so I use our initial template. Um, it doesn't have all of those things in it. And part of that is because D section asynchronous classes are not going to have Zoom class times. Um, so we don't have that added in there. Um, and instead of videos being in the nav bar, um, it is that Panopto is linked into the content so that you are actually putting it in the content and it's not another item on the nav bar that they have to click to to get to the videos because it's so important for content to be linked within each module and not have to send students out 
six or seven places to get to things if it's linked right there and it's easier for them to progress from step to step to step. Um, so it's kind of intentional um, as to why it's not there is to keep things more streamlined for the student. But great question. Kim, I can I ask one more? Sure. Which is, is there, a, is this supposed to happen? If I got a student banner, my students have a different nav bar than I do. So, and I don't know if that's part of the evaluations issue. Like I put in evaluations, but it doesn't, like they have a completely different nav bar than me. Did if I you put student. evaluation in your nav bar? Yeah. Instead of as a widget? Yeah, but like in general, when I switched from like myself to a student banner, the nav bar is entirely different. Oh, other than just edit course being removed? Yeah. Uh, we should probably look at that. <laughs> like the edit course should go away when you switch yourself to student because students don't have the capability of editing the course, but everything else should stay the same. Um, yeah, that's what I thought too. And I was I, wondering if that's also why I can't see evaluations. It's like, there's just some sort of weird bug in my, because it's the evaluations also disappears. That's when I noticed it. I was like, if I get a student better, do I see evaluations? And I, it's just not even there. And it may be because it's not available to students yet. Um, like students can't get into your semester of my evaluation um, information yet. So it, it may just be that it disappears for students because they can't see it yet. Ah, okay. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, that question that we should, we should probably, we can it look into that. that. It might just we'll be make that. a note. <laughs> we'll look into that and figure out why it's doing that. Um, yes. That is also, however, part of why I think it should be a widget, not your nav bar, because that's just a lot in your nav bar. Y'all know how I feel about a nav bar now. <laughs> what other questions do y'all have about um, Tutor Me or my evaluations or nav bars or home pages? Because we have one more that I want to, it's our five and a half. It's our asterisk because it has come up just in the last um, few days. And I will show you all the one I'm talking about. Um, I was like, please tell me you're not about to break again. <laughs> okay, so we have to go into an active class for you to see this because it was not in the development shelf. Um, so I'm going to show you an active class that is uh, one of the ones that I'm teaching right now. Um, and oh, it's no, because I deleted them. Um, so <laughs> it updated, y'all. We had a whole conversation about it. Does anybody in their class right here under updates have a thing that says broken links? I bet like every one of you does. And you're like, why? What does this even mean? Why do I have broken links? So it is a, a newer setting in D2L um, that registers broken links. It's not registering them accurately. Um, so I'm just here to tell you, uh, don't panic. Uh, don't worry. Um, it's okay. Uh, and if you click on it, you can go in and you can delete them so that it quits telling you. But there's a really good chance that it'll show up again. Um, it typically has to do with if an overnight report or system gets run and it happened to be at the same time that somebody else's website that you linked to was also getting a, an update or upgrade because most things get upgraded around like two or three in the morning. Um, if D2L ran at that exact same time and for whatever reason it didn't click all the way through because they were doing an update, it gives you a broken link. Um, if a student clicks on something but then it doesn't finish loading before they close it, it could give you a broken link. If you have um, a discussion that you created and once upon a time had links, but no longer use it and you removed it, but didn't permanently delete it, it could show up as a broken link. Um, so we tell you all, all the time not to permanently delete things because permanent makes us nervous too, because permanent is permanent. Um, but if you've got something that's embedded in the back end of your class, so an old Dropbox that you deleted but not permanently, um, an old file that you removed from visibility, but it's still in your managed files and it is an inactive link. That is what is causing your broken links. So you, you have a couple of options. 
you can go through everything in your managed files and see if you can figure out what thing no longer leaks accurately. Um, or you can, um, in your ask the class discussion boards, if you don't have one of those, we'll send you a, we'll send you a template for that. Um, your ask the class discussion board, you can post a thing about, hey, make sure if you ever come across any links that don't work, post them here and we'll make sure to get them updated. Uh, you could post an announcement about it if it's something that you're really concerned about. Um, students tend to tell us when links don't work. It's like the fastest thing they do. Um, they tell you when something doesn't work. So if you're not getting notifications from your students via um, any kind of email, either D2L or local, or they're not calling you or any of those things like that, you probably don't actually have any broken links in your class. It's just D2L playing a cruel trick on you in the first week of school. Sorry. <laughs> we're, we're trying to figure it out too. Um, we're not sure 100% why I got turned on, if it's not working quite accurately, but that's what it is. So that is also our five and a half, our little asterisk, because we really felt like y'all needed to know because it's showing up in your active class screens. Um, the only reason I don't have any is because we were making an example earlier that you can go in and delete them and then it still shows that you have those same broken links but apparently if you log out and log back in the broken links thing goes away until the next time it runs um, so does anybody have any questions about those broken link things yes holly mentioned that she actually turned off the tool nice um do can we show anyone how to turn off the tool or holly would you be willing to contribute how you turned off the tool um, I just uh, went into tools and turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so from any course, go to tools, go to broken link viewer, turn it off. We hadn't tried that yet. I know. Thank you, Holly <laughs> and Dr. Godwin. <laughs> To be um, fair, I, I had asked somebody, I think it was Jennifer, to turn it on because um, mm -hmm. I'd asked about her, about, asked about that, and she said it was in beta, which is yeah. probably, it still probably should be in beta because it doesn't work. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't work because um, it really does pick up on things that aren't actually broken links it just randomly throws stuff at you um so yeah i mean that would be magical if it actually you know scans your class and and found stuff that youtube has taken down that would be a magic bullet it would be amazing because you never really know until somebody goes in there and you never know when youtube's going to take something down um it would be amazing so that's how you do it um let me show you all how to do that again um from edit course Scroll all the way down to the very bottom. It's under administration. Uh, it's tools. And then you will scroll to the one that says broken link viewer and just turn it off. That will now not appear in your class. So there you go. And also thanks all. <laughs> Cause now we can send that update out. Um, Cause we never even thought to go check tools. Of course you can turn things off. Didn't even, mm -mm, didn't even cross my mind that we should start there. Mm -hmm. Clearly, it's been an interesting summer for everyone. <laughs> All right. And does anybody have any questions about anything? Those were the five and a half things we wanted to make sure that we covered. So does anybody have any questions or anything that you would like for us to cover? I do want to say for those of you who are asking about rubrics, particularly discussion rubrics, you can email me directly at Tara.Perrin at MTSU and I'll send them to you. And we will also work to get a link on our faculty resources website specifically for rubrics that, that you guys can get access to as well. Mm -hmm. But give us a minute, but it will be there. <laughs> we have a lot that we can send you. Um, I was gonna show you a few of them in one of my things, but it's, at least the internet's still working, unlike earlier when the internet just shut down. So it may be a little bit slow, but it's, it is working. Um, and we have ones that we can export and send to y'all, as I mentioned earlier. Um, and there's like four or five that we have that we'll, we can just create an export and make it so that y'all can have those. When we create an export, it comes as a zip folder. And you, uh, when you go to 
copy components um, in any of your classes. Import is one of those options. So when you're in your COG, um, you go to the one that says import, export, copy. Um, I have a lot more options in my COG than y'all do. Um, so don't freak out. <laughs> Um, but you import, export, copy, and when you go to import, you import the zip file, and it will drop those rubrics right into your rubrics folder, and then you can go in and update and edit them. So just don't open the zip file or it won't read it. Just keep it closed. Um, we had a question from Ashley specific to H5P. Ashley, we will be doing um, a workshop on that called H5 Please on September 20th. Um, so I hope that you will be able to come. If you're in a big hurry, though, I want to know. Go right here, and you click File, Create a File, and then you click Insert Stuff, and it's right down here at the bottom of your Insert Stuff, and H5P is right there, and then, oh, there it is. Um, and every faculty member has access. So if you want to get in and play around with it, you can. I don't recommend playing around with it in an active class. Since you're creating a file, you don't want to cause a panic amongst your students. Um, so if you have a development shell, I'd say go in and play in one of those. If you need one, um, you can fill out a form and get one. Um, but it's always good to have a sandbox. That's a place that you can kind of go play and check out new stuff that isn't in an active so see if somebody can get you a sandbox if you do not have one. And if you have questions about that, let us know and we'll help you get one. And we hope you can attend. It's going to be very active. We're going to do some fun things, including maybe a breakout room or not a breakout room, an escape room. An escape room. Um, and talk about ways you can incorporate very fun things into your class. Yes. Are there any new faculty, like brand new faculty that met us on the Monday of new faculty orientation? That are in the group. Yeah, did you did you do our escape room? It was on the back of our card. That was an H5P for those of you that were there um, and got that little card from us. That was an H5P um, escape room that we created. So, and by we I mean Karen. Uh, Karen Hine created it because she's awesome. So, um, yeah, we can't wait to tell y'all all about the cool stuff that it can do. Other questions? I'm gonna turn off my share. Uh, is the video note for students also set for 30 minutes currently? I can't remember, I know it is for faculty. Yes, yes. So specifically tell your students you don't want it to be longer than a certain amount of time because if every student shares a 30 minute video note introduction in your introduction discussion board, it's gonna take you a lifetime to get through all of it. Other questions? Yeah, I think we've addressed all the questions that are in the chat. Please okay. let me know or let us know if there's a question that I missed or we didn't address. And then we're just open for general questions. Yeah, we can stay for a while. It's actually 1230. So I know some of you probably have places to go. Um, so thank you so much for coming. We hope that this was helpful for you and that you got some useful information moving forward. And we will stay around for just a little bit um, to answer any questions that anybody has. And I'm gonna hit stop on our recording. Hey Kim.